Hi everyone, thanks for coming to Theory Launch. This week we have Sarah Allen talking about incremental Voronoi diagrams. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Um, I'm Sarah Allen and I'm going to talk about incremental Voronoi diagrams, as Colin said. Um, this is joint work with Luis Barba, John Iacono, and Stefan Langerman. Can everybody hear? Um, so I'll start by defining a Voronoi diagram. So let's say you have a set of n sites in the plane. Um, the idea is that we want to partition the plane into regions such that every site has one region and every point 
in the region of a certain point is closer to that point than it is to any other point. So for example, in this example here, uh, the magenta polygon here is all the set of points that are closer to that one point contained within the polygon than any other point in the set. Um, so some of the motivation as to why we might want to study these. Um, classic example is a post office problem where you have some city and there are n post offices and you want to basically allocate people to post offices based on their proximity where we assume Euclidean distance is going to be uh, a measure that we use for that. And uh, generally speaking, you want people to be to near the closest uh, post office to them. Um, also, you can use a Voronoi diagram to answer questions of the form, you know, where should we put a new post office um, in the case that we wanted to do so. And it turns out since every three sites define a circle, you can find the circle that is the largest empty circle, and that actually is the best new location that will, uh, that will have the maximum benefit for everybody. Okay. Um, also, uh, Voronoi diagrams contain other information about the point set. Like, for example, the convex hull is actually defined by these outer cells that kind of reach out to infinity here. As you can see, I've kind of outlined the convex hull of this point set, and it's basically these cells that are on the outer boundary here. Uh, further, the dual graph of the Voronoi diagram is called the Delaunay triangulation, and it's actually used a lot in graphics for like approximating uh, basically surfaces. Um, and this is the Del Delaunay triangulation. It's a triangulation that basically makes your triangles not very long and skinny, but kind of uh, short and fat, or relatively balanced, I should say. Um, uh, another thing is that Voronoi diagrams are a pretty fundamental problem in computational geometry. Um, this they're studied all the time. Uh, in higher dimensions, they can be used for nearest neighbor queries, although we're not actually going to do that here. We're only going to be talking about sets of points in the plane. And they come up naturally in a lot of contexts. So I have a few pictures here, like where they come up in nature. Basically, any case where you have things growing uniformly out from, one, from a set of points, the, boundary is, the boundaries that you get are the Voronoi diagram. So is that really supposed to be the case with the animal patterns? Like that's supposed to be? Yeah, so it actually shows up, I mean, it's not exact, but right. it shows up a lot in nature. And there's also pictures of like leaves and things that the structures very much mimic. So it's not just that it's made up of cells, but it's actually supposed to be that there's like some Points. I guess, yeah, the points would be like, the Voronoi regions would be the sort of brown spots with the giraffe, I guess. And I guess if you're, I don't know how giraffes yeah. grow or how, yeah. yeah. But, but probably nobody else does that. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> or my favorite example is the cookies that all sort of expand at the same rate and then hit each other. <laughs> but they appear a lot. Um, and so they're actually studied across a variety of fields that are, actually there are many, if you look at Wikipedia, there's like countless applications to Voronoi diagrams. And so I'm just gonna go over some of the basics here as to you know what kind of output we're expecting from our algorithm and what we want the representation of a Voronoi diagram to be. So, like I said earlier, we're gonna refer to these uh, points here as sites and we're gonna assume there are n of them. Uh, further, the Voronoi diagram is a graph, so we also have Voronoi vertices, and in general, if I say vertex, then I'm referring to the vertices of the Voronoi diagram. Um, and just a little note here is that, you know, we have some cells that sort of go out to infinity, so it's really unclear, you know, how those edges are supposed to work, but we kind of assume that they have a point or an endpoint out of infinity, even though I've sort of drawn them ending here. Um, we have faces, just like in any plane or graph. And uh, for a given site, we might refer to this as the cell for that site or the region for that site. Okay. Um, so for each edge, we actually are going to represent it as two half edges. So you see we have two directions for the one edge there. Um, and we do that so that we can keep track of the faces on either side of that edge. And notice they're directed edges going in opposite directions. 
and they do contain pointers to each other so that we can easily uh, compute, you know, what the nearest, fa the adjacent face is if you know what edge you're, what half edge you're looking at. And so the whole thing sort of looks like this if you were to do that on all of the edges. And you notice, for example, if you wanted to look at a face, you could just walk around because you have pointers to the next edge and you also have pointers to the site that defines the face that the half edge is incident to. Does it loop around on the infinity ones as well? Pardon me? Does the when you have those ones that go off to infinity, is that also like a loop? Yeah, so I mean, there are many different ways you can okay. deal with this. And one thing you can do is you can sort of, in your mind, picture, uh, those are really, really invisible. But um, oh, yeah, I see. Okay. yes, sort of along this convex hole here. I mean, there, it's out of infinity, so it's not well defined. But yeah. just for sort of uh, definition purposes, to make things consistent, you can think of adding these edges in between the, the points of infinity. Uh, so is everything clear about this? Um, so just some background, um, they can be computed in order n log n time, and that's Fortune's algorithm. And there's a lower bound of n log n, and it sort of follows from the lower bound on sorting. Um, so if you're familiar with computational geometry, computing a convex hole is sort of the analog to sorting. So let's say we had, you know, this is a number line, and we have these numbers that we wanted to sort. Um, what we could do is we could actually project them up onto some sort of, yeah? Uh, what do you mean by computing a Voronoi diagram? Uh, so computing a Voronoi diagram would be given a set of sites, producing that uh, graph that I showed earlier with all of the pointers and the half edges. And, okay, and so you faces. start with the sites and you want to get the, uh, exactly. the, the line. Okay. You want to be able to get that structure. and. Um, Yes, so you don't just keep the graph, you have to maintain some extra information about you know, things that are incident and adjacent to one another. So, again, if we wanted to sort these, uh, these, these numbers here, we would project them on a convex curve. We'll assume it's not linear, just to avoid degenerate cases. Um, and then, basically, the convex hole of these points will give you a sorted list of the points, because in our model, we're actually given pointers all the way around. So a convex hull is, uh, if you're outputting a convex hull, you're also outputting the points in order, in sorted order around the hull. Um, so you can't really do better than n log n in terms of computing the Voronoi diagram because it contains the convex hull. Okay, so now we move to incremental Voronoi diagrams. It takes n log n to, to compute this thing. Uh, suppose we wanted to add this site here. Um, so really, we'd end up modifying the diagram to look something like this. We would add these orange edges. But you notice that like, most of the diagram really hasn't changed a lot. So do we really want to run this n log n algorithm again? Um, it doesn't really make sense to do so when the change we've made is so local and really only affects these few vertices here. So, do we need to recompute the whole diagram? Hopefully not. Um, so, basically, incremental Voronoi diagrams allow for the insertion of new sites, hopefully in a more efficient way than recomputing the whole diagram. So, there are a lot of algorithms that are used in the context of trying to compute a static Voronoi diagram where you just incrementally add points. Um, and these are efficient if you know the sequence of points in advance but not if you have uh, dynamic points coming where you, you can't predict what the next point is. So for example, uh, sorry, are there any questions? So let's say you had a set of, of sites like this. Um, your Voronoi diagram might look like this, but if we inserted this point, um, what we'd have to do is basically just take this whole, I guess, curve here and we would translate it, but we actually wouldn't change the structure of the graph that much. So you see like these vertices, they move, but the structure of the graph is really the same as it was before, more or less. I mean, we're gonna have to add you know, an edge to, to deal with the two points up there, but we shouldn't have to update all of these points because the topology of the graph is not changing very much. 
And you could imagine sort of constructing a sequence of points that, that you keep doing this and getting closer and closer um, and having to basically modify a linear number of, of things even though the graph is basically staying the same. Yes? So when you're computing the Voronoi diagram, are you computing the location of the points or just what the graph structure is? So that's actually the main bullet point of the talk is that most of the algorithms that we have now, uh, basically you have you know, these sites that are embedded and you want to compute the Voronoi diagram, which is an embedded graph. And they will, basically, they will give you the coordinates of the vertices, for example. And what this paper is about is sort of shifting our view to focusing on the structural changes to the graph, the underlying graph, as opposed to focusing on coordinates. And that's sort of the entire motivation for the paper and the talk. So it's a very good question. <laughs> okay. So if we were to choose a random permutation of points, the expected number of changes is actually quite small. But the problem is this isn't dynamic. So if we had points coming in one at a time, of course, we can't retroactively go and randomize <coughs> the permutation of points. So we need to have an algorithm that works for any permutation of insertions. Um, so our algorithm can be randomized. It just can't depend on the order of the points. We have to allow for a worst case sequence of insertions. Um, so can we use the fact that the structure of the graph doesn't change a lot to sort of do better than before. Um, so, yes, this is. Um, so basically, in the case we had before, you would do better. But in this case, for example, um, if you wanted to add the center point, you'd still have to update most of the graph. But you have okay, three sites to find a circle. And we're assuming there are no four sites that are on the same circle. And this is just a general position assumption. Um, it's pretty standard. And it's just to avoid degenerate cases and sort of um, weirdness and breaking ties. Um, so the center <coughs> of the three points here is actually one of the Voronoi vertices. So we actually don't need to explicitly maintain the coordinates of those vertices if we have the other information and we have enough pointers to our adjacent and incident you know, edges and faces and, and such. So, it might just be the Delaunay diagram? Pardon me? Aren't you saying you just want to maintain the Delaunay? Yeah, I mean, it's the same thing. Um, <coughs> if you're maintaining one, you're maintaining the other as well. And that actually, that is important in that there are structures that allow, for example, uh, to do point location queries or nearest neighbor queries, I should say, um, faster than we're going to do them, but they don't actually maintain the structure. So if you wanted to do some sort of, you know, check if there's a Delaunay edge, you wouldn't be able to do that because it doesn't maintain the, the structure of the graph. It actually uses other techniques to uh, just only do one nearest neighbor queries. Uh, but that <coughs> might be for uh, obvious. Okay. <coughs> Great. So um, the idea is that we want to maintain the graph of the Voronoi diagram, but not necessarily the embedding of the vertices. And instead, we're going to be counting the number of links and cuts, where we have links basically are the addition of a new edge, and cuts are the deletion of an edge. So it definitely improves this scenario that we had before because, like we established, the, the vertices are just being translated. They're not actually changing in terms of, there's really no edges being uh, added or deleted, or there are very few. But in the worst case, let's say we have something like this and we want to add the center point. Then there's really no way to get around the fact that we have to add all of these edges and also delete the, the basically the subtree in the middle. Um, and that's going to possibly require a linear number of links and cuts. And we are concerned about worst case behavior. The thing is, uh, most insertions are actually not going to be like this one. So, you know, for example, let's say you do this insertion, it takes, you know, linear amount of changes. But if you wanted to try to force it again, you'd have to kind of go to one side or the other. And you couldn't continue to add points in a way that they all take linear time to add or in terms of they all take a linear number of changes to the structure. And in fact, adding this site will make the subsequent insertions less complex. 
So that's what we want to capture. So instead of looking at what's the worst case number of changes for a single insertion, can we bound the average number of links and cuts over a sequence? So the sequence is still a worst case sequence, but we have on average kind of amortized over the sequence how many links and cuts are necessary to maintain the diagram. So yeah, no, amortized number of links and cuts per insertion. So is this uh, clear to everybody? The problem statement is okay. So just to be more formal, um, for any sufficiently long sequence of n sites in the plane, uh, what's the amortized number of links and cuts needed to maintain the Voronoi diagram after each insertion? And furthermore, I mean, we do actually care how long does it take to perform these insertions on average in expectation. Um, where again, this, you know, we can use a randomized algorithm as long as it's not dependent on the order of the insertion of the points or the sites. <coughs> Generally, when you say expectation, it's like expectation over the permutations? No. Um, so you can do well if you actually do randomize the, the permutation of points that you feed to it, but we want it to be, we want it to work for any possible sequence, even an adversarial sequence. Oh, okay. But there are some structures that we're going to make use of that are randomized, but they use internal coins that have nothing to do with the sequence of points being inserted. Okay. So we're not relying on you know any particular order, which kind of makes sense, because like in the real world, I mean, things are changing, and you just want to keep things up to date. Yes? What about the best case? Like, if I gave you the best sequence of insertions, would you be able to get end again, uh, even though you do things incrementally? Um, I'm sorry, like you're asking if you, so, so, so you so have pre-computed the so best. Like if, if you gave me all of the points and I computed, that would take n again. I'm asking now, if I did things incrementally, so at every point I have to maintain the Voronoi diagram, mm -hmm. I gave you the best sequence of insertions. Uh, instead of the average case, the best case, uh, would I always be able to get n again? Would you always be able to get so n again? Um, I mean, you Hmm. I don't know why you wouldn't, but I'm not totally sure, actually. So, I feel uh, like you should be able to, but... I may be jumping ahead because you may be telling us that the average is log n. So uh, what's going to be the well, average? Well, you think it's going to be log n, but it's not. Um, <laughs> the thing is that our bounds are actually going to be combinatorial in nature, so we don't necessarily know if there's a point set that realizes it. So it's sort of we can get lower bounds on the number of changes for this general planar graph operation I'm going to define, but whether there is a point set that corresponds to that is unclear. So, um, this sort of, uh, so just to clarify again, ordering of vertices, or sorry, the ordering of the sites is worst case, and the algorithm is able to use other sources of randomness as clarified. Um, um, I might switch to using n for the number of Voronoi vertices, and um, that's just because basically it's a planar graph, and the two uh, quantities are going to be linear in each other, so it won't affect the asymptotic behavior. Um, some related work. There is a data structure that can perform nearest neighbor queries, one nearest neighbor queries uh, in the plane, uh, dynamically in polylog amortized expected time per insertion, but it doesn't maintain the diagram. So that's the drawback here is if you wanted to do any kind of query other than a, a nearest neighbor query where you're just finding the closest point to you or trying to identify what cell you're in, then you would be out of luck. Like for example, like Gary had suggested, you know, the Delaunay triangulation. Um, you might want to check if two points have an edge between them and you would need to have the diagram to be able to do that. Um, and it turns out you can solve this in uh, log and amortized expected time per insertion if the sites are in convex position and you actually add them in order around the convex hull. Um, so our results are as follows, and this is sort of gonna be an outline for how the rest of the talk is structured. Um, so we're gonna define a general planar graph operation uh, that's able to model the insertion of new sites, um, but it doesn't necessarily have to be for Voronoi uh, insertions, it's just a planar graph operation that is somewhat combinatorial in nature, and that's sort of what we get our lower and upper bounds on. So we upper bound the total number of amortized links and cuts for this particular planar graph operation, 
and we use a potential function to do this. And then we also come up with a lower bound for the worst case amortized number of links and cuts. But sort of getting at the question earlier, um, this is for this general planar graph operation not necessarily realizable by a set of points, at least not that we know of. And I'll just show that to you. And then I'm going to sort of very briefly uh, present kind of the framework for the algorithm that would be able to have insert sites that are already in convex position. So it's a very restricted case, but we don't have to actually insert them in order around the convex hole. They just have to be in convex position. Um, and the runtime will be dependent on the number of links and cuts. So we have an output sensitive algorithm. Does convex position mean there? That's the, just like sorry. convex? Yeah, so it just means that basically every point is in the convex hole of a set of points. <coughs> or, point, like it's or it's on the boundary, okay. yeah, of the yes. convex hole, yeah. Like, does it have to be inserted first before the ones inside the convex hole, or? Pardon me? Do they have to be inserted first before the ones inside the convex hole, or? So, it, almost like imagine in advance, we know that every single point is in, con is in convex position, the whole point set. Uh, and then we can talk about any sequence of possibly adding them. So we're guaranteed that the point, the set, the set of sites will be convex or in convex position for the entirety of the algorithm, and including future insertions. Those points are also going to be uh, the entirety of that will be convex. Is that clear? Uh, so, so you're saying that it's only convex? Yes. So this is a very restricted case, and you know, it, it really does have drawbacks in that way. And a huge open problem would be to try to extend this to much more general class of, you know, uh, point sets. But this is sort of a first step, as this is a preliminary result, or it's at least a direction that we want to go in. And so it's it's not quite all the way where we'd like it to be. Yes? So you're saying that if we, if we in, insert them in, in an adversarial order by an adversarial position, that that they're better than n squared total number of oper uh, changes? Yes. That's true? Yes. What is the bound? So um, the total number of changes amortized is going to be square root of n. So it's square root of n per insertion. Yeah, it's into the three halves. I guess, yeah, so if you wanted to, uh, and then there's some polylog factors as well for, you know, actually computing it, but it's order n squared. Order n squared per insertion, so order n three halves. Of the way there. So let's define this planar graph operation. Um, so let's say we have this simple closed curve, um, and it has to intersect each edge at most once. Um, the subgraph inside this curve has to be connected, and um, basically it doesn't intersect any of the vertices. So, I mean, it, basically it, just, it looks kind of like a, a circle here, and you can picture it as sort of a, an ellipse or a circle, but those are the technical requirements. Um, and also it enters and exits each face at most once, so you can't do any weird like squiggling in and out and, and all of that. Um, so this naturally will define a sequence of edges if you have this tree and this, uh, this curve together. And I've sort of <coughs> just put an arbitrary uh, direction on it so that we can, uh, we can define a sequence of edges and we have a start point. Um, so the natural sequence of edges that this defines is just the set of, e of edges that are intersected by this curve in order. So for example, the first one would be this bottom one here. Um, can you see the color change at all? Okay, so the first one is this bottom one here. Second one would be the next one if we just sort of follow the curve. And then we would be able to proceed around the whole thing for every intersected edge. Um, so then what we do is I'm going to define an operation to change the graph. And while I'm going to define it in a way that sounds sort of algorithmic, the algorithm doesn't actually do this, but this is just sort of for clarity in terms of understanding what this operation does at a fundamental level. So for every one of these intersections, we add a new vertex, a Voronoi vertex, at this intersection. 
Um, and then what we do is we connect each one of these new vertices to the vertex on the next edge. And then we delete the subgraph that's inside. Um, and just to note that this will add at most two vertices to the graph total. Um, and in this case, it didn't, but imagine it might if you had something that sort of exited or came from way outside the graph. Um, so I'm not really going to prove this, but it should be pretty easy to see that this operation can perform a site insertion. I mean, it looks exactly like what you would expect um, an insertion in a Voronoi diagram to look like. And like I said, uh, the algorithm used later doesn't necessarily proceed in this way, but it's good to keep this in mind as sort of our primitive operation. So uh, I guess now we should be more formal about what do we actually count as a change to the graph structure? I mean, we, we had this example earlier. But we basically have a few different kinds of, of changes that can happen with this curve. And now I'm just going to be looking in, zooming in <coughs> at curves intersecting sort of the boundary uh, or the edges. Um, so if you have something like this, where it's just you know, two edges, then the curve crosses here, then we add an edge to the face that's sort of external. Do we see? So the complexity of the face increases. So we call that an augmented face. And we would definitely consider that a change. Similarly, if we have a lot of vertices, <coughs> um, then we cut it here. Then we're decreasing the number of sides <coughs> on the boundary of the space. So this would be a shrinking face. And again, this counts as a structural change to the graph. Finally, we have this, where it's basically the only case where we have um, exactly one edge in between sort of these two edges that intersect the curve. And in that case, this is one of those situations where the vertices would simply be translated down and there's no structural change. So we call that a preserved <coughs> Um And it turns out that I'm not going to prove this, but if you go through many pages of uh, like planar graph facts and case analysis, um, you can actually bound the number of links and cuts. It's not links divided by cuts, it's just links and or cuts um, in terms of the number of crossed edges, faces deleted, and the number of preserved faces. Um, so how do we bound this quantity over a sequence of operations as opposed to you know, for a single for a single face? Um, so first we'll define a potential function. And for a single face, the potential of that face, f, is the minimum of the sides of f, meaning the number of edges on its boundary, and square root n. Um, so in this case, like for example, assuming, I don't know, assuming there's some larger structure and square root n is larger um, than you know, the complexity of this is pi. And for an embedded plane graph, uh, the potential function is simply the sum of the potentials of all of the faces um, with some constant alpha. I think alpha ends up being something like 16 or whatever, just to make the math work out. But um, really just think of it as a sum of the potentials. So here's the intuition. Uh, large faces, when I say large, I mean larger than square root n. Um, they don't really lose potential when they shrink because you know we've capped their potential at square root n. But we still have to account the removal of their edges. So what we're going to look at first is breaking our, our sequences that we have, these edge sequences, into subsequences um, only on small faces. So I'll show you an example here. Um, so now I've just changed the potential function to say the size of f because we're assuming we're in the case where we're only looking at, at small faces. But we have this like huge <coughs> face here in the middle. And let's say that that has a complexity larger than square root of n. Then we're just going to consider analyzing these two curves separately. Um, and being kind of hand wavy here. Uh, so we can't have any long chains without shrinking phases. And this comes partially from the fact that the graph is three regular. Um, and, and that was from our general position assumption as well. So for example, if we had two augmenting faces next to each other, 
then this vertex really can't, I mean, this is basically it. We can't do anything in terms of expanding this, this way or this way. And further, you know, the same thing, if you wanted to try to do the same thing by inserting some preserved phases in between, you really can only get constant size structures um, and nothing more than that. Meaning that basically uh, we can't have long chains without having some shrinking phases. <coughs> Um, and the intuition then, with a lot of counting of degree two vertices and um, a lot of like facts about planar graphs, like in the Euler characteristic and just again case analysis, um, is that uh, the augmented faces and the shrinking faces are paid for by the shrinking phases. In that you know the shrink, assuming we're still in the small case, the shrinking faces lose potential when we uh, perform the operation, so that, that's okay. And then also for every augmenting phase, you know, there should be a shrinking phase that's able to cover it as well. Wait, so how are the shrinking phases paying for the shrinking phases? Or do you mean the preserved phase? So the shrinking phases, um, so we're, we're talking about still in the case of, of a thin root n, but let's say we have like a relatively, like a, a small but not too small shrinking base, like the one kind of second from the left. Um, the complexity of that is actually changing, you know, at least a fair amount, because we're removing all of these edges here, um, but also the potential is decreasing as well. Um, and then just another thing is that we are actually analyzing each of these sequences separately, um, but we do want to think of this in the context of we are still performing one global operation that consists of many of these sequences. So for example, <coughs> since it's, this curve is going to be closed, it might wrap around and we have to take care to avoid double counting the edges that kind of are on this path that are in the upper envelope here. Um, and again, all of this is just lots of planar graph facts that you know, we, we exploit, and I would not bore you with all the details of it, but. Um, so, the in, is, the, is the intuition clear, at least to everybody? Even if we don't have the exact, like, numbers, but, you know, assuming within constants. If we had the right constants, then the shrinking faces are able to pay for both of the removal of their own edges and the removal, and the addition of the new edges for the augmented faces. <coughs> So, and it turns out, we can't really do much about these sort of big faces here, but there are most n to the one half of these subsequences because each of these faces has, you know, square root of n complexity and how many can have square root n complexity? Square root n. Um, okay. So, I guess let's go into the lower bound that's combinatorial. Um, I won't make you verify this, um, but this is a planar graph, and we have sort of the curve is this purple that's going around, um, and I guess you can believe me that the number of links and cuts it performs is square root n. Um, and it turns out that once you perform that operation, you get this, and these two graphs are actually isomorphic to each other, so you can keep repeating this operation over and over again. Um, so that, that's how we get our lower bound, is that you could just keep doing this over and over. Um, now this is kind of where I, what I was saying earlier, where this looks kind of complicated, and I'm not sure if there is a point set for which this is the Voronoi diagram. In fact, it seems uh, we haven't constructed one. Um, so that would also be another direction to possibly take this, is to look at, is there a point set for which this is the Voronoi diagram, or is that not possible? You know, if you restrict yourself to graphs that can only be realized by you know, being the Voronoi diagram of some point set, can you do any better? Can you get something lower than square root n? And that's all I'm going to say about the lower bound, really, because it's just a big, complicated picture. Okay. Is there any theory about like what graphs can be Voronoi diagrams? Like what properties graphs that are Voronoi diagrams have? Um, in what sense? I mean, there, there definitely are, like, but. So there's not a. So there are three, oh, well, sorry. For every graph, there's 
not a point set that's a Voronoi diagram, I'm assuming. Otherwise, <coughs> otherwise, like there would be a point set for this. Right. Well. So has anyone tried to like classify the set of graphs that are Voronoi diagrams? I'm not sure points? what work has been okay. done on that. But all I know is that we at least don't have the construction of a point mm -hmm. set you know, that realizes this. Do you have a question? No. Oh, okay. Thank you. All right. So we'll go through uh, the algorithm very briefly. I'm actually going to probably gloss over some parts of it, but just because uh, I wanted to go over a little bit of how it works. Um, again, we're assuming the points are in convex position, which is a huge restriction. But the reason we do that is because then the Voronoi by oh, excuse me, sorry. Then the Voronoi diagram is a three regular tree or a binary tree. Um, so I, I guess uh, because the Voronoi diagram is a, is a tree, we can actually make use of a uh, link cut trees, um, which are a construction of Slater and Tarjan. Um, and we modify them and add some functionality in order to be able to use them for this purpose. But yes, we are highly dependent on the fact that we have a three regular tree. And that's why we need uh, convex position. So let's say our tree looks like this. Um, and from now on, we're not, I'm not going to really think about, you know, the positions of the points so much, just think about trees. Um, and the Voronoi diagram doesn't really have a root per se, but it is easier to think about a rooted tree because the operations we perform for maintaining the tree uh, do kind of assume that there is a root. And, and it will change with the insertion of points. Also, there probably should be like a little edge coming off of the top of the root to make it through regular, but we don't worry about that so much. So uh, what a basic overview of how the structure works is that you decompose this Voronoi diagram into paths using a heavy path decomposition. And so basically for every vertex, you choose one of its edges or one of its like, child edges. That's why we want to think of having a root, because we want there to be some sense of parent and child. And we mark one as heavy and one as light, and then we recurse. So let's start at the root, for example, and let's say we mark the left one as heavy, then you see we made it thicker. Is the thickness difference clear? Okay. And then we continue down, and at each vertex, we choose one of its children to be heavy and one to be light. Yeah. So let's say it was like this. Um, and a common way of doing this, for example, might be to look at you know, which subtree is larger and make that one the heavy, the heavy uh, edge. And you would also do the same thing on the other side as well. So once you have a light edge, then you assume you're starting a new tree at the end of that end point there. Okay. For each of these paths, <coughs> you create a biased binary tree. So we have a tree here, but then basically we're going to create a tree for which each of these points or each of these paths sort of is a set of leaves. And this, this tree is biased in such a way such that our operations will be efficient. And we're kind of using that as a black box, so I'm not going to go into the details of that. But um, vertices closer to the root in this tree are sort of the leftmost leaves in these uh, biased trees. So, like, for example, the tree would kind of grow, like in this big path here, it might like grow this way. Um, so here are some of the link cut tree operations. Um, you can have make tree, which I guess makes sense. You create a new tree. Um, you can link two trees by taking any vertex and then the root of one of the trees, and then you can connect them, and that's a link operation. You can cut an edge, uh, the leading edge. So this is a lot of what we wanted to do with the Voronoi diagram. And then there's something called ebert, where you basically take a leaf and you make that the root of the tree. And you do uh, recalculate all of this uh, decomposition when you do that as well. And it turns out this can all be done in time, log n per operation. And that's a feature of link cut trees. Um, so then what we want to do is find out which paths have vertices that we actually want to change. And the way we do that, I'm going to go through this pretty quickly. Um, so let's say we have this point here. We're actually going to pick. Um, and perform an evert so that like this new site here has the root 
on the boundary of the new face that's going to be created. So we're kind of going to pick you know, the adjacent cell and, and root it there and rehang the tree. And also, I've shown it close, so we haven't changed the tree, but you could imagine doing that. Um, and it turns out then, we can, these paths also contain pointers uh, towards the root of the path. Um, and that's all of those changes can also be done for the entire path in time log n. So now, I guess, the, we want to figure out which paths, have to, which paths have vertices that need to change. And um, so we did the new path decomposition. And the idea is that we want to find out which paths have roots, where the root is sort of the closest vertex to the root of this tree in the new cell. So for the new point, uh, we create some, a definer circle where we take the three closest points to that point, and then those three points define a circle. And the idea is to find paths that have roots inside of this circle. Um, so. Testing for points in the circle. Um, the rest of this is going to get a little bit abstract, but um, we'll go through it a little bit. Um, so you're going to project each point onto a paraboloid uh, where you have, so you have x, the xy plane, and then you project it up to x squared, y squared. And each circle can actually be stored as a plane such that that plane intersected with the paraboloid is that circle um, down in x, y, in the two dimensions. So is that, does it give a picture of sort of what that might look like? Um, so I guess now we just need to test if these path roots have points in the circle. Um, and it turns out that if these points in this projected space are lower than any plane in the structure we've created than they are in the circle. Um, and that's an if and only if. So it turns out there is a dynamic structure for extreme point queries, uh, and it's by Chan. And it uses, it actually takes planes and finds, uh, or I guess it takes planes and finds points that are extreme multiple. So it's kind of the opposite of the kind of query we want to do. So we transform into the dual using point plane duality. I'm not sure if anyone is familiar with that. If you've taken a computational geometry course, you might have seen like point line duality. It's just the same thing in three dimensions. But it basically just means that the picture looks different, but you know the, we haven't changed the information at all. Um, and we sort of use some tricks then after that. Um, so just to kind of go over what we've gone through, um, the idea is that rather than focusing on the specific embedding of the Voronoi diagram and the vertices of the Voronoi diagram, uh, we really want to keep track of structural changes to the graph. Um, the number of amortized changes is at most n to the one half um, per insertion. Um, and each change can be implemented in polylog time with respect to the number of changes if we use these two structures that are sort of you know, as black boxes for this. And future directions, you could take this. Um, of course, extend the algorithm so that it works on sites that are not in convex position, because we very much rely on the fact that the Voronoi diagram is a tree. And that's only the case when the uh, points are in convex position. And of course, that lower boundary <coughs> is purely combinatorial. So again, you'd want to either find a sequence of sites for which the operation is realized, or somehow you know, work on this lower bound if you add this restriction of you know, having to have a point set that corresponds to it. Um, and that's it. Any questions? So I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, have you thought about, like, instead of adding, instead of dynamically adding points, like removing points or, or moving points? And yes. seeing if moving it changes the structure. So, I mean, moving would probably just be a, a deletion and re-addition. Okay. Um, but yes, so a, a huge thing is to have dynamic Warner diagrams that allow for both insertion and deletion, and that's definitely something that we'd want to make use of. Um, and the one of the structures we, we use actually does have a deletion operation that is used in our algorithm, but not, since it's not a direct translation, um, maybe we could use it, but at least this doesn't support uh, deletions right now, but that is definitely a great future direction to take it. Yeah. 
So this is worst case over the points in the order. Um, yes. So I guess, has anybody looked at something where, uh, you know, an adversary is putting down the points in whatever order they want, wherever they want, except that whenever the point gets put down, it gets returned to win, just in some small ball. Mm -hmm. right? right? So I guess the idea would be that somehow most of the trouble here comes from these really s sort of strange events with ex yeah. extremely large spaces and things like this. Well, so, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Um, well, the example I showed you, I mean, you, that I don't think the perturbation would really help much because it's just fundamental to... Which example? The, uh, the one with the little tree in the middle. The one with like the point, a bunch of points in an arc and then the one up here that you sort of iteratively just come closer. But I mean, for that arc to be really long, Mm -hmm. Like to actually be like root n or something, I think it would take a significant amount of. I mean, I, obviously it depends on how much you perturb the points, right? But, uh, I guess. I mean, I, yeah. I don't know what size perturbation you're thinking of, but then you could always just make the point. Right. So I guess suppose that I give you like a root n by root n box mm -hmm. that you're allowed to put the points into. So on average, each you know each cell will be like constant area, mm -hmm. and we perturb the points by some constant epsilon. Mm -hmm. Right. So could I still create these? Extremely large faces. Um, I think you might be able to. I think it is pretty easy to construct these adversarial instances, although I'm not totally sure. But it's. I, I think you would be able to. Yeah? Um, is there any chance any of this makes sense in higher dimensions? No. <laughs> <laughs> All of this is completely in the plane, uh, two dimensional. So yeah, I kind of mentioned this like connection to uh, nearest neighbor in like learning, and that it's not real. I mean, usually you're in much higher dimensional space. Sorry, you mentioned uh, you want to have a good randomized running time. Where do we, uh, where do we actually use uh, randomness? Yeah. So I was there was a structure that I sort of glossed over in one bullet point at the end, <coughs> and that uses randomization, um, and it involves basically maintaining. Uh, a 3D convex hole based on that plane, those planes that were sort of the projections. And it turns out the way that that convex hole is represented, it, it's basically decomposed into tetrahedra, and how that decomposition works is randomized, but it has nothing to do with the order of the <coughs> Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, thank the speaker again.